Hi, everyone. Welcome. I uh, hope you're having a great day. It's great to see all of you. Um, let's just give this just a few more minutes. I, I know people tend to uh, arrive just in time or maybe a minute or two late. Uh, it's great to see all of you. I already see uh, people from a lot of different corners of the US. So you are currently muted don't take it personally it's just to like minimize all the chatter and the food and all that good stuff but i i will certainly um unmute you just to, to do the welcome and then we'll go back into muted mode just what let's give it just one more minute thanks all ¿Qué serios estamos hoy, no? Okay, why don't we get started? Because I think we certainly have a nice quorum. It's great to see all of your faces. Um, and thanks for joining us because, uh, again, as I always say, you have a lot of other options of what you could be doing right now, whether it's 3 p.m. in the West Coast or 6 p.m. in New York. Um, I, I want to thank you um, for being here. This is the third in a series of photography talks that have focused on getting to know actual contemporary photographers. Some of you have joined me for previous sessions that were actually lectures on photography going back to, way back to the 19th century and beyond. But then this idea emerged of getting to know people doing photography today. And it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Jody Watkins. Uh, I'm gonna ask Jody to unmute herself right now. Okay, there, there we you go. Are. That's Jody. Um, Jody, welcome. So much to look forward to uh, having the group get to know you and also see this this amazing body of work that you did just now in 2020. Um, so just to let you know, um, uh, Jody and I uh, actually met. I think it would be fair to say we met through our dogs. Uh, <laughs> We live in the same beautiful building in Midtown Manhattan called the Park and Dome. And we met several years ago now, uh, walking, you know, walking our doggies. And uh, it came to my attention that Jody was a photographer in one of our conversations. And I remember she shared with me some really amazing photographs she had done in Mexico, which happens to also be my native country. So that was very exciting. So when I started um, featuring current photographers doing work, I, of course, I was like, I remember Jody. She had shown me some wonderful photographs. So, so without further ado, um, we're going to be not only getting to know her a bit as a person, but seeing this fantastic portfolio she, she created uh, during these terrible times of COVID. Um, one thing I will ask you to do is, if you don't mind, uh, you're going to benefit from having speaker view once we get started, because otherwise you're going to see all these lovely Brady Bunch type faces and that, <laughs> won't, that won't be as exciting. And um, the other thing I'll ask you to do once I start sharing my screen is, well, let's start doing that and then um, I'll explain what, what I want you to do. Um, there is a little feature at the top of your screen right now that hopefully shows viewing options. It's, it's ideal if you put side by side because what that's going to do is that it's going to show us, you know, show you the slides on the left and people like Jody and me speaking on the right. So if you can give me a thumbs up that that worked, um, that would be great. Yay! Um, excellent. <laughs> Um, so 
without further ado, uh, let's see. So, so there's Jody looking fantastic with her camera. Jody, um, we're gonna get into a bit more about where you grew up and, and how you got into photography, but just tell us for a second about this photograph and what you're holding there. Well, you know, I started um, photographing with a roller cord um, and this was in Salt Lake City, Utah, where I was living for five years. Um, but I've, I met, met a friend and uh, she used a roller cord and she kind of influenced me there. She was taking beautiful photographs of the canyons and color, coloring them. So I just, she sort of taught me how to use it and um, I used it for about five years um, until I moved on to uh, a Pentax and then my Leica. Okay, um, here we go. So, um, as I said, uh, we're going to be seeing this amazing body of work Jody took um, in Central Park. And I think many of you know, but you know, Central Park is, is this incredibly iconic park in the middle of New York. Um, it's, it's usually already one of our favorite places to go because Jody and I live walking distance. But of course, in 2020 with COVID, it was, it was quite an unusual park, right? So, um, you know, after the shutdown and the curfews, uh, the park suddenly, you know, there were no tourists and there were no vendors selling anything. And yet for people like us, and as you'll see for Jody, it was this kind of amazing respite, right? Like, oh my gosh, we still get to enjoy this park. And, and what you'll see is that Jody uh, found a way to connect, find a human connection right here in this wonderful park, even at a terrible time. But before we start with that, I thought we'd just go back and just do a little bit of show and tell. Um, Jody, tell us about this. You were a, you were, you were a little girl in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And this was my grandfather and my brother. My other brother, I don't think, was born at this time. But my grandfather was, um, you know, was of this great combination of arts and science. And he was a great photographer. So I grew up, you know, looking at his photographs on the walls and, you know, he'd photograph me a lot. And, you know, I just it, it subconsciously had a big effect on me growing up. And this was one of his photographs. You know, he had a dark room. He built his whole house around the dark room. And this was an image he took in um, Italy. Um, so that was probably back in the 50s. It's really, I love the effects he achieved. It's, it's beautiful. And you mentioned he might have known Ansel Adams. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so then we get to your older childhood or teenage years. And I said to Jody, I found these kind of vintage photographs of <laughs> Cupertino. Tell us about being in the Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, growing up there, we were surrounded. It was never called Silicon Valley. It was called the Santa Clara Valley. And we were surrounded by orchards and all the kids worked in the orchards. You know, we picked fruit, we sliced fruit. You know, fruit was just a big part of our life back then. And, um, and malls. I know you <laughs> all there. <laughs> I love it. And then this little company kind of yeah. set up shop in Cupertino. And there, I love that here it still looks like a little building in a strip mall or something. Right. Um, and, and now we know what happened with Cupertino and that's the big Apple spaceship. Um, but you were there when it was probably a little quieter. Yeah, I mean, I went to high school with all the guys that started Apple, so. It's amazing. Um, Yes. And Things then were... uh, what's fascinating about Jody, I mean, when I started seeing all the parts of her life, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. So it's so Portland, California, now suddenly you're in Hawaii. Yes. You know, and I was, you know, nature was a big part of our life back then. I was, you know, into, it wasn't, I didn't dive with tanks. It was all free diving. And the guys in the middle all believed that you know, you can't, using tanks was not fair to the fish. So they had a very philosophical view about catching fish. And I was with this group for many, many years. It's amazing. And then 
we um, have this wonderful picture. I love it because it's it's just the epitome of 70s fashion, right? And I love your hair too. So. Yeah, love my mom's hairdo there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you came to New York City to go to this beautiful school here, Columbia University. Uh, right. so, <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, you left California to come to New York. <laughs> Well, actually, in between that, I was in Utah. Okay. Working, I was based there. So from Utah, I mean, I, after five years, I couldn't wait to get out. So I applied to Columbia and got in there to finish a language requirement. Yeah, and tell us about that language because people told you to take Spanish and what did you take? I took Nepali because <laughs> I worked in Nepal. I was a nurse over there and you know, when I went back to school, I had to have a language and I thought, well, I could either move to Madison, Wisconsin or to, to New York City and go to Columbia. So that's why I applied to Columbia. And I thought, you know, I know it's not practical, like people, um, <laughs> you know, you should learn Spanish or France, but I didn't want to. I wanted to learn Nepali. So that's how I ended up here. Well, I, I love it. And, uh, and then you know, now let's start looking at some of your work and, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna basically explain to the group that you know, we made a very conscious decision to look at the work that's you know, what, what Jody did in Central Park in 2020. But, but it, it's not fair to not at least acknowledge that she has done some great work for years and in a lot of different parts of the world. Um, right. She happens to travel a lot for work so tell us about this wonderful image well, you know i spent a lot of time in moscow back during perestroika and i was there for probably i want to say 15 days a month so i was watching you know the country change over the years and become a free market society uh and it was um it was interesting this was taken down um the metro systems in moscow if you've never been there are just beautiful they're really works of art and i just you know took my camera every I, I shoot and film i've never really gone digital except for the um the work in central park so um yeah this was just a photo i took down in the metro station i i you know i love the reflection and i i love i have to say it but there's there's this very kind of straight geometry to all the tiles and he's not straight geometry he's more kind of in the, the um, Hitchcock kind of profile looks. I love it. Um, and this, again, another reflection. Yeah, this was uh, a girl that I met when she was very young in a Siberian um, or orphanage. And, you know, I sort of mentored her over the years and helped her through school. And, um, you know, I was coming to visit Siberia, so my friend, and her daughter and I both came to Siberia, and she um, she really you know, like fixed herself up and, and posed for me here. It's it's wonderful, and and what you're going to see about Jody is that the images are kind of the ultimate output, but but what it's really about is these amazing relationships she creates with people in in cases like this one, long term relationships, and mm -hmm. um, it's an amazing amazing image. Um, tell us about this. This was in the slums in Mumbai and, you know, I spent a lot of time going in there. I, you know, they, they gave me access to them. The light was great. And this girl was a, a little washer girl and it looked like she had a bandage on her thumb from probably washing. And I just, um, you know, photographed her there. She let me, she was very open to it. But I got to know several of the children in the slums, so every time I went back, I'd photograph them. Amazing. And this was Mother Teresa's Refuge. Um, this was in Kathmandu. This was back in um, probably 1980. But, you know, the great, you know, they gave me access to the refuge too, so I came in and, and I know some Nepali songs, so I sing them to some of the people in there and they just, um, I mean, they loved it. That's amazing. And then uh, as kind of a transition here, 
Some of you may remember that in the previous talk, we met Tim Porter, who had spent time in Oaxaca. And guess what? Uh, I met Tim through Jody. So Jody had spent actually even more time in Oaxaca, Mexico, and studying under Mary Ellen Mark. Um, and, and this is Mary Ellen Mark's recent book, I believe. And, and Jody, tell us about your time in Oaxaca. I know it's hard to summarize in one slide. You spent so much time there. Yeah, I did. I started out with a workshop. Actually, one, a neighbor in our building had taken a workshop and told me about it. Mary Ellen has always been um, a photographer that I really connected with, her work. And so I took this workshop and she said, my friend said, she took a hundred rolls of film with her. And I thought a hundred rolls of film, you know, so I brought a hundred rolls of film and I got really nothing. Um, that was my first workshop, but I stayed with her for, you know, 15 years and really began to um, find my voice, my photographic voice. And I found that I am a, quiet photographer and I'll spend all day on one photograph. I maybe at the most will shoot two rolls of film a day. So in this book, um, The Portrait of the Moment, she used one of my photographs in there. And this is a photograph I spent probably uh, three to four days on. So that's amazing. That's great. Um, so let's just look at a few of the photo. I mean, your portfolio in Oaxaca is tremendous and it's of many, many years. So right before Central Park, let's just look at some of the work you did mm -hmm. down there. Do you want me to explain this? Um, if you want. I want to just go through them. This was Natalia and Poopies it was the name of the dog. And it took me years to be able to photograph her. She was very shy. And then when she saw her cousins being photographed, then she let me photograph her. So. I love it. It's just, the, the way they're both looking mm -hmm. up that way is, is remarkable. But also to hear about your process. And you told me that Mary, Mary Ellen taught you to keep going back and back. So this idea oh. that, you know, this is not just some random picture. There's a lot of attempts and a lot of working, in this case, with Natalia. Right. You know, and she would always say to go back and I would, you know, like after three days of going back to try to get the same, you know, get it right on the photograph, she, you know, I was just like, I can't just can't do this one more day. You know, but she would push me and I went there and, you know, I seemed to get what I was looking for. So. This and is this the one, one you told me was particularly difficult to get. Yeah. I mean, this one was, um, you know, this is the one I kept going back and back and it was cold. Paola is one of the girls I photographed for 15 years and this is her baby. And she wanted to surprise me with the baby, um, you know. So when I came mm. up there, um, it was cold. So my, my window of opportunity to, the baby would hiccup when it got cold. So I had to really hurry and photograph you know, and just get, get that moment right, um, and then keep going back, you know, until, by the fourth day I got it. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, just two more of this, this kind of, kind of samples of your work in Oaxaca. Yeah, these are two sisters. They're actually, the Lopez family has four kids, three, three girls and one boy, and they were just, you know, it's, they were sitting in a corner watching TV and I thought, oh, this, you know, photograph kind of needs something a little different. So I felt, I kind of walk around. I mean, I have total access to their, they trust me. I have access to their houses. You know, I just kind of got this veil and put it over them. They didn't even blink. It was just, they kept watching TV. So that's how I did this one. The way they're covered both by this veil is, is beautiful. Um, and then this one is, 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 is fantastic. I like it. Yeah, and this is Federico. He's the only boy. And basically, this is their cat, Sylvester. And I, I got a ladder and I wanted to, this is a bedspread. 
and he was on the bedspread with the cat. And, you know, I was just kind of looking down on him um, to get this photo. But, you know, he's, he's really good with animals. And, you know, I think he's, he's grown up now. He's got a family of his own, and I think he's a gang member. Oh, my. The, yeah. the, the vantage point is, is so fantastic from above. And, but, of course, juxtaposing him and the kitty with, with this giant elephant. And, and I just, I love all these kind of diagonal lines. You know, they're, they're, they're part of the kind of the bedspread, or the, but, but they're also part of the cat. There's, there's a lot of the really cool kind of synergies in the visuals. Um, so, so that, and by the way, uh, we'll make sure people have your website because there's just so much that you've done in previous years. But let's talk about Central Park in 2020. Um, I think one of the benefits of having seen what you just showed us is that it already tells you that Jody is someone that really gets to know people. So her photography is really about that human connection. I mean, if you, you know, she knows the names of all these people, she spoke to them, she sang songs to them. And that's something that, wait until you see all the people she met in Central Park, because I'll tell you right now, some of them are people you would probably walk away from. Many New Yorkers would say, oops, gotta go. And Jody, <laughs> frankly, in a very brave way, just said, these are human beings and they're here in Central Park and I'm gonna get to know them. So very quickly, I just wanted to acknowledge that there's, there's an interesting tradition of photography in Central Park. And so I'm saying Jody is in good company because an iconic photographer like Deanne Arbus uh, spent a lot of time in Central Park. And some of you may know this iconic photograph of a child with a toy grenade. Um, and of course, Arbus was often looking for, you know, who's really uncanny or different or strange. And here she took a photo of, she calls it a very thin man. And I mean, those legs really are unbelievably thin. Um, but, but again, a huge tradition of this, of finding people in the park, not having planned it and, and documenting that. And then I also just included as an example, a few photographs by Gary Winogrand, who in particular was looking at people in the Central Park Zoo and he, managed to find these images that are kind of provocative and kind of kind of funny and kind of strange in this one this man is is courting this woman uh but it just so happens that there's kind of a wolf <laughs> coming in their direction which is it's kind of fun because it's almost like who's the wolf right um, and then this this image that you know, she, he bumped into this couple that was not only an interracial couple during the time of the civil rights movement, but instead of carrying children, they're carrying these little monkeys. So it's this kind of very kind of strange, uh, ironic, slightly provocative image. Um, and by the way, Arbus and Winogrand exhibited together at MoMA in the, the exhibition called New Documents um, in 1967, I believe it was. But let's talk about Jody's. Uh, I thought it would be fun to show a map just to give you a sense for where we live and what, what's, you know, where these photographs were taken. Jody, walk us through this. Um, well, you know, we left our, um, at the Park Van Dome, which is 56 between 8th and 9th, and then went to Columbus Circle. And then from Columbus Circle down to Poets Walk. And then from Poets Walk to the Bethesda Fountain. And when I saw this series that Jody did, what, what I thought was remarkable is that we never bumped into each other because this is precisely, some of you that follow me on Facebook know, these are exactly the images I was taking through 2020. Not, not of fascinating people like Jody, but just this, this is a very familiar walk. And, and I actually 
had seen many of the people that Jody shows us here. So let's, let's get started here. Um, I took the freedom to curate a little bit um, and look at Jody's photographs and kind of put them in some order of things that New Yorkers were doing in the park. And this was one of the first things New Yorkers were doing. Yeah. And this was taken probably in, I think, maybe March. So it was the beginning of the distancing. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, it's, you see the distancing on this beautiful bridge and then people kind of finding their own little place to, you know, put their chair down. Um, the other thing, well, and then this. Is like, <laughs> Yeah, this, this gentleman built a shield. So he taped it, he put wood on it. It was very creative to protect himself against COVID. Wow, it's amazing. That's, that takes a lot of work. And he's really serious about creating his shield there. Yes. And, and this, you'll start seeing this, this type of railing and you're gonna see the Bethesda, fountain terrace a lot here. It's this very, very special spot in Central Park. I called this section masquerading um, because I noticed that Jody had found so many people obviously wearing masks. And not wearing masks. <laughs> and, not, and not, and yeah. And, <laughs> and the ones wearing masks screaming at the ones not wearing masks. Yes. Um, Tell us about this incredible image. Well, this is my doorman to here. And, you know, he's got like a gas mask on. And I really couldn't initially tell who he was. So everybody was getting very creative with their protective gear. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And what was interesting is that the policy in the building was that they needed to tell us that certain people from the staff had gotten COVID, but they right. couldn't tell you who. So there was this kind of strange guessing game. If someone was missing, you'd think, oh my God, I think it might be my doorman or it might be my porter. And this was somebody I met in the park with an Israeli gas mask on too, so. Um, yeah, I mean, talk about serious mask brilliant. wearing. Um, I think you, yeah. You did a remarkable job kind of capturing folks that were really serious about wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear. You know, nobody really knew their way. We were all trying to find our way. So what I like about this image is I don't know how many of you know. Um, but the Bethesda fountain is known as the Bethesda fountain because of the angel. And this fountain and the angel go back to a biblical story that's about health and purity. And so there was this very interesting idea going on where, you know, COVID was around us and people masking up. And in a way this, I felt like this angel was there kind of looking after us in terms of health and purification. Um, yeah. There were a lot of religious people in the park. Mm -hmm. um, she was there listening to a sermon. And uh, yeah, this, this was a creative mass. She was actually visiting from Sacramento. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. And then sadly, you caught one of the things that we saw way too much that really upset us, right? Mm -hmm. um, way too many disposable masks on the gutter and in the park. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's like a great time capsule of, of what went on. Uh, the other thing that was going on, I called this little mini section, staying mindful of the horror around us in the park. Um, oh yeah, this, you know, this is kind of a very horrifying beauty, um, but all of these tents came up for the overflow. I mean, there was so much going on in the park then. 
you know, the Mercy ship was coming in, Javits was opening with all these beds, the tents were going up on the East Lawn. You know, it was very, it's very disturbing. It was just all this sort of, you know, gloom and doom and yeah. stress. And, you know, it just, um, it was almost like we were, you know, at war, a bomb had dropped or something. That's how yeah. it felt. Yeah, I agree. When I, when I walked, I walked all around the park, you know, way up to 110th and past this. It was one of those things that you had kind of, heard about in the news but when you actually see it physically and the fact that these were you know tents for mm -hmm. as you said the overflow and actually i i don't think they ever filled up so but they were there uh, no i remember it was almost as if we were ready for even more and then mm -hmm. New York fortunately kind of took control and right things were not quite as bad as as we suspected I loved this because you're going to find that of all the photographs that Jody took in the park, this is the only one that has color. <laughs> um, but I included it in this section of kind of the horrors of COVID because it's, it is a dead bird, correct, that you bumped into? Mm -hmm. And um, there's just something incredibly sad about that. It was almost like a reminder of, you know, COVID is real and this is this, is this terrible little bird, beautiful bird in, in the park. One of the things you documented is, well, when gyms closed, <laughs> I mean, the park's always been a place for people that run and do all kinds of exercise, but suddenly that just exploded. It was almost like, where else can I work out? but the park so i think mm -hmm. this is beautiful this was the, during spring too so the flowers were all in bloom yeah i see that it, and and by the way that part of the park there, there was something wonderful about the park in the sense that it was almost a reminder that you know with COVID, trees will still bloom, you'll still see blossoms, you'll still see squirrels. In fact, there were more birds and squirrels than I had ever seen in the park ever. It was almost as if the, the animals decided <laughs> it's <laughs> our park now, the tourists are gone, you're all gone. I've never seen that many um, you know, animals in the park, it was incredible. So again, folks, that Bethesda fountain area became a little bit of an outdoor gym. And this was a yoga teacher and I, he doesn't wear a mask. He didn't have one, but he was giving yoga lessons to people that wanted them. His name is James White Tiger. Oh, nice. Again, Jody actually spoke and got to meet all these folks. That's the part that's wonderful. Tell us about him. I miss John. He's an unemployed cook. And every day I went to, the, to Bethesda, he had a different costume on, a different, you know, he danced around the car. He wore these outfits. He would play Frisbee. You know, he was, he, he wanted to make people feel better. That was his goal. I, I love this image. I love the symmetry. I, there's something you know, almost religious about it, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's a section about people like him because one of the most striking things about the park uh, was realizing that so many people in the park were the people that were left behind. Mm -hmm. So there might have been people like us that live in a nice building near the park, but there were also all the people like John that are basically out of work and struggling. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk a bit about them. This is just more exercise. People were using these steps as kind of a Stairmaster. Absolutely. And there were trainers down here training people. That was my own Stepmaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this woman up here is doing her yoga. But I like the 
it kind of, she reminded me of the bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. The, the, uh, the architecture in this, this terrace is beautiful. There's these mm -hmm. gorgeous kind of reliefs with flowers and birds. And I, I do love, it does look like she's about to you know, fly away like the birdie. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, this is Terry. And she's another person doing yoga in the park. And she actually told me that she wanted to run for president. And she was serious about it. So, uh, you said you didn't join her because she was too advanced or something like well, that. Well, she wanted me to join her, but I thought, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to be on your head at the Bethesda. No. <laughs> <laughs> What's what's great is how the angel is is kind of right there i mean the the mm -hmm. it's so fun it, there's something very fun and wonderful about this some people of course were just relaxing mm. this flag um i noticed throughout pretty much the year was at half mast I think it was out of respect for just all the people lost to COVID. Mm -hmm. This is it's so beautiful because this captures, again, the natural beauty of the park was there throughout all of this. And, and just some of the scenes uh, again here, you know, with these gorgeous trees reflecting on the water and this young man just kind of studying or relaxing, it's beautiful. Again, the park was this kind of this amazing respite in the middle mm -hmm. of the pandemic. That's Joshua, he's a skateboarder, you know, and you know, he looked, you know, kind of edgy and, you know, scary, but he was actually such a kind, gentle boy. And he really wanted me to photograph his gold teeth, but I, I... <laughs> His grill, I think. Um... And these were two roller skaters. And it, that's Natalie. And, you know, some people have said that have seen this, like, <clears throat> why didn't they have a mask on? And my friend Charles said, well, you know, they're smoking. <laughs> so, um... You know, there was a lot, there's a lot of public shaming going on in the park. Mm, yes. It was important for me not to, um, to be that shamer, not to judge, but to, you know, keep a healthy distance. So, and I told Natalie, I kind of want to get something a little edgy. And so she, she pulled her pants down and she had a little tattoo there by her bikini. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's great. These are like, you know, we're tough, tough gals smoking our cigarettes. Right. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and again, the kind of the sad flag at half mast right behind them. Mm -hmm. One of the amazing things in the park, as some of you know, there's often street performers and, and musicians and some of them were there even when the park was really empty. Right. And normally there are big crowds. This is um, Carlos. And his songs were so soothing. And I would just go there every day and listen to him. And normally there would be crowds of people around him. And to go there and be like the only one listening to him. It, mm -hmm. You know, in a way it was such a gift. Some of you who are New Yorkers may know that this part of the Bethesda Terrace is, you know, it's, well, I won't say indoors, but it's, it's a passage from these stairs out to the fountain. And so you're, the acoustics are great because you've got mm -hmm. this beautiful tiled ceiling above. So a lot of the musicians and singers often put themselves in there because it's almost like being like in a little mini Carnegie Hall. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is. He, he, this, and I can't remember his name, but he's usually there with his whole family 
and the family has just got such a beautiful voice. So, you know, he, during COVID, he was there by himself almost every day. And then there was a violinist. He was actually from New Orleans, but had come to New York. And I don't know if he came here to make us feel better or if he was here before COVID, but he was another very talented musician. And that's my friend, Jana. <laughs> In a bubble. Yeah, yeah, these, uh, these, uh, these people uh, making enormous, gigantic soap bubbles are kind of a fixture in, in the park. But, but again, what was amazing is that they were there this entire time. So it, it's almost as if, you know, I'm here when there's thousands of people and I'm still here when there's just a couple of people. Right. Really amazing. Mm -hmm. This little section I call taking a stance because I noticed, you know, a few people that were kind of taking a stance. Um, I do understand from Jody that um, Mary Ellen Frank's assistant has focused on the part of New York that was really about Black Lives Matter and taking a stance in that regard. That was like, there was so much going on at the time. So I'm very interested in seeing that work. Uh, these are not necessarily about that stance, but I love this couple's messaging, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were spreading the word, you know, in a very passive way, but they made sure everybody saw their t-shirts. It says, no mask, uninformed, arrogant. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, as someone that went on long walks around the loop and whatnot, I was definitely screamed at <laughs> by people that felt I wasn't far away from them enough. Well, I you think, know, you New know. Yorkers, New Yorkers will tell you what they think. Yeah. And as you said, this couple's doing it in a, in a little bit of a more passive way. Yeah. But they you still know, have their would, messaging. People would tell you if you were not six feet apart. Oh, yes. You blow your nose. It was like a constant, you know, reminder when you went out to exercise or walk in the park. <laughs> yes. And then we've got... Yeah, the religious people were there. The religious people. He looks like he means business. And um, what's, what's kind of funny about some of these images is that, you know, by the way, that's the Trump, one of the, the Trump hotel with, with the big, so anyway, we won't get political, but, but we, there's some images here that you have of people that are very down and out and have the Trump mm -hmm. building behind them. Mm -hmm. um, I love this section. Uh, because you really did find that, and I have to say, you know, my doggy's been a, a huge relief during this time. Mm. So you saw, you, you photographed a lot of people bonding with kind of loving creatures. Yeah, he was just right at Columbus Circle and had the two dogs, so I thought, yeah. So this is, so, I like the bike in the background and this woman was just, you know, giving treats to this dog. You know, everybody was kind of helping each other out in certain ways. Yeah. I love this because it has that kind of uh, decisive moment, Cartier-Bresson decisive moment where it's this second where, you know, the bike's up. I love that this doggy is looking like why didn't you leave me here? <laughs> right. Hey, I'm over here. What's going on with the big dog there? Um, some more people here enjoying mm -hmm. their doggies right at the fountain. Yeah. And this was um, Stella and Sam. And I, what I noticed about the park at the time, our roots were growing out. So I asked her, <laughs> Stella, I said, do you mind if I take a, I said, I won't show your face, but I'd love to take a photo of your roots. <laughs> and she let me. <laughs> so uh, and then the next time I, I saw her, she had dyed her hair. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. Have you given her this photograph? <laughs> uh, she actually went to Florida, so she's... Okay. But I will when I see her. I love that she's like... I have not made, well, let's face it, that, that's why this is such a great time capsule of what went on. You know, people were desperate to get back to their beauty parlor and get their oh, yeah. Um And the doggy um, leaning forward. Tell us about this, Jen. Yeah, and this was Nanny. And he, you know, it's funny because my girlfriend kind of, I think, pointed him out first. And I didn't realize he had a pigeon in his hands. And the first thing he told me was that um, he lived in the Bronx with his aunt. His mother was in the hospital. He um, had acid reflux and schizophrenia, and he wanted to save this pigeon. Mm. And, so, and I think you told me you're, you're not even sure if the pigeon really was injured or not. Or... No, I really don't know. I couldn't tell. But I mean, the fact that the pigeon was letting him. Yeah, hold. it's amazing. You know, it might be a little sick. It's really beautiful. Um, and, uh, you know, this idea of, you know, during COVID, he's wearing a mask and he's kind of taking care of this bird is kind of what everyone wanted during 2020, right? Like, I need, I need, I need protection. It's really beautiful. And um, I just felt like somebody like him, you know, was probably not getting a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. You know, he's somebody that would, I'd pass somebody like this on the street and just, you know, ignore him. But for some reason, you know, the COVID brought out sort of this connection I felt um, connected to everybody, no matter what their background was. We all needed to, to be heard and to hear each other. Oh, Jody, I think what you've done here is so remarkable because you're right, you know, New York City and a place like Central Park is one of these places where you have all walks of life. You, ha you could have a millionaire, you know, six feet away from someone homeless. And for you to just go in and meet these people and talk with them and, and give them attention and give them time and take their images is a really wonderful thing. Yes. Yeah, this is, you know, I was, we were walking through the park at night, too, and I'm thinking, wow, ra raccoon, this is the new New York City nightlife. I yeah, love I it. And park at night. No, no bars, no discos, everything. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, except for the raccoon. And it's in keeping with this idea that, you know, the, the animals kind of said, this is our park now Absolutely. and and yeah it's it's not just your your pigeons and your squirrels there's raccoons as well um but the fact that you captured it as well with kind of the the big big buildings all lit up and everything it's it's almost a silhouette right it's really mm -hmm. wonderful um and one of the things people didn't stop doing which is very very special is celebrating um, I actually, I'm seeing someone here on the Zoom call that got married during mm -hmm. <laughs> the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so she can relate to this section. Uh, people were celebrating in the park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this couple, I think they had just gotten married. But it was just so sweet. You know, they didn't let COVID get in the way. I, it's an amazing picture, just because it's, again, a reminder that, you know, even um, bride and groom had to have masks on and, right. you know, take them off accordingly and so on. And this was an Indian wedding. Oh, I just realized none of them have masks on. But um, anyway, yeah, so that was going on. Another celebration. I think it was the same family. And this is Dina. And she is a single parent and just graduated and has a job lined up. So that was good news. 
And, um, you know, she was there with her mother and her baby. And I thought it was so sweet. I love it. And, and, and it, it must have been, Jody. I, I assume, like May or June, or that time frame. It was when, June. When all, suddenly you have all the graduates. And, mm -hmm. and again, whether it's your wedding or your graduation, Central Park is like, that's where you want your picture taken, you know? It's the right. place. And then she sat on her hat. What feels like the end is the beginning. And I felt like that was appropriate for, you know, the COVID situation. And now this is, again, I mean, one of the kind of most moving parts of this whole series, because I call this struggling to survive. But, you know, again, talk about realizing that you know your circumstances in the park are very different from that of others mm -hmm. well this is melody and i first met her she was sleeping on a bench one morning while i was doing a walk and i was kind of interested in her so i didn't want to wake her and you know later maybe the next day i saw her in bethesda and we we sat and talked for a while she's a um she was a singer She's from Philadelphia. She came to New York and, you know, she's homeless now. And she was looking on Craigslist to find a place to, um, to rent. And in the background is George. He's another person that lives in the um, Bethesda Fountain area. Oh my gosh. Um, really difficult stuff because you really, you, you got in front of these people and spoke to them and discussed their, honestly, their dire straits and the situation mm -hmm. they're in. And, and again, this particular part of Bethesda Terrace is, you know, under a ceiling. So it makes it kind of the ideal place. I mean, if you need a place to hang out and sleep and stay warm, um, that's, that's what it is. And this is George. He, um, he lives in Bethesda Fountain. He was an ex-cab driver, and he had been married four times. And, you know, I didn't ask him too much about his life other than that, but, he, you know, he's now homeless, living in the, right near the fountain. <clears throat> yeah, I mean whether you're a taxi driver, Uber driver, Lyft driver, whatever, those folks have been in just terrible situation in the last mm -hmm. year. I mean, th there's, whenever I get into either a taxi or an Uber, I say, how is it going? How are you doing? And mm -hmm. it's, it's bad. I mean, the city is so, so empty right now. This is an interesting fellow because, you know, I was standing at the uh, Columbus Circle and he, I thought it was so strange. He came up to me and he said um, that uh, his mother was in the hospital and um, he needed money. And, um, you know, I didn't have cash on me. His name is Manny. I think it was Manny or I think the other one was Vinny, Manny. And um, so it, it just seemed like in Midtown, what was happening, it was they were putting all the shelter people in Midtown hotels. So they were all like living in our area. And, and I think he might've been one of the shelter people. And so during the day they'd come out and, you know, either sell art or ask for money or, but you know, there are a lot of mental health um, issues. Yeah. And I think he was probably one of them. It was sad. Yeah, very sad. And this is again the irony of kind of the Trump, the Trump Hotel in the background, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's John again. Mm -hmm. This is Goldman, and he's a, a street performer. And, you know, he, I don't know what he does for his performance because he didn't really have a crowd. So he was just standing there with his mannequin. But he, he told me, he said, I can't wait for life to get back to normal. Mm. 
And, and this is one of the people that I saw many times, you know, given that this is my entrance to the park. Mm -hmm. So when I saw your photographs, I thought, oh my God, I've seen, I've seen him. <laughs> and I believe that he's usually one of those people that does like the human statues that don't move mm -hmm. at all. Right. And so that explains their color. It's almost like they become either a bronze or gold statue, but um, yeah. Um. This, this gentleman was a, um, a Cuban artist uh, that was living in, he's another shelter person that was moved to Midtown. And he was actually a really good artist, but he was um, you know, selling his art down at Bethesda during the day and then going back to the hotel in the evening. He came over to Cuba, from Cuba, uh, got married to somebody he met in Cuba, and now they're divorced. I think the fact that as a photographer, you know these stories, you know, you remember the names, you, you know about where they came from, their divorce is, is remarkable. It just, mm -hmm. the, your connection, again, to the people in the images is remarkable. This is an interesting guy. He um, is another shelter person. His name is W. And he did not want to um, be photographed. It took me a long time to... He, design, he designs clothing and what he's wearing is everything that he's designed. I don't know where he gets these little scraps, but he really makes some beautiful creative things. And this headgear, he can't really kind of hides his face because he didn't want anyone to see him, but he calls himself W. And W is one of the other people that I saw multiple times. And so when I saw your portfolio, I thought, oh, this is amazing. Like Jody has actually, you know, captured these folks that were almost fixtures of, of Central Park. Um, and I agree, I, I always thought, my God, um, I think Anna Wintour from Vogue needs to see this. Um, there's <laughs> something incredible. Um, Very, he finally let me photograph him, you know, but even his pose during the photograph was very creative. Oh my God. You can see the headgear and the, the work that's put into what he's wearing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's just, and it, all these little, this necklace are little, I think, pop tops, like from, you know, either beer or Coke or something. That is incredible. I see, I see them, yes. Mm -hmm. I know we're uh, uh, running a little bit late, but here we go. Staying fashionable is something people, you know, it's New York City, so COVID or no COVID, you're going to see some fashion. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a designer for Lane Bryant. And actually, this was a light blue. I probably should have kept this in color. And he had a blue sequin like mask on. And that's John again. He said, every time I see you in the park, I know you're going to photograph me. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I'm very cool with that. <laughs> <laughs> this, this was an interesting guy I photographed. Um, he was here from San Jose, California, visiting his uncle, and I photographed his uncle. I don't know if that photograph is in here, but his uncle was just crying, like, I'm so happy to see my, my nephew here. And he was so uncomfortable with that and so stiff. You know, he barely moved. His uncle was just all over him. So there were a lot of tears in the park, too. The, uh, the Einstein Chanel, um, <laughs> I included it here in the fashionable section. And this was um, Artemis, and she was from Chicago. She moved to New York during COVID. Um, and she, this was on Easter, and she said that she didn't want to wear a mask because she wanted to feel beautiful that day. I, I, I love 
the, the entire look of this photograph, the vantage point, I, I, I don't know how, how you took it, but there's something, you know, that makes her kind of larger than life. And you've got these gentlemen kind of walking towards us in the background, but it's just, you know, she's like the goddess, you know, Artemis, she's very, it's a lot um, beautiful. This is Artemis on a different day. Oh. It's John again, different costume. John made it into several sections and, and like <laughs> he was one of the ones that you really followed. Yeah, I did. And finally, because we're at the top of the hour almost, people didn't stop loving. So, got this, this really nice, um, beautiful, is it a mother and daughter? And, mm -hmm. and <laughs> this is the uncle with his son. <laughs> right. And the, not son, but nephew. The and nephew the kind of like. Very uncomfortable with you're, that. You're throwing off my macho look here in the yeah. park. Stop with the hugs and the crying. <laughs> By the way, that noise, I know somebody asked about the noise. It's a, um, something's wrong with the heater. So there's a banging every now and then. I'm sorry about that. And these are some couples that you met. Mm hmm This was on Easter. Ah. Uh, And, and as, as you know, Jody, when I saw these, again, it took me back to some examples by Deanna Arbus of couples she would bump into in Central Park. Um, sometimes, of course, as Arbus always is a little bit unusual, um, like these two friends, and you can't quite make out, uh, they're just, their size is so different. Um, Anyhow, um, but but I love what you did of uh, finding these these couples that again uh, are enjoying the park, and then I thought we would close because it's seven p.m. with this. I think it's a beautiful image because you know one of the most iconic images in art history is the Madonna and Child, so this is in a way I think. Uh, a mother and child as well in, in the times of COVID. Yeah, she, this was one of the first photographs I took. This must have been in March. And um, yeah, just uh, there's a lot of tenderness there. Yeah. Well, I and hope, I hope uh, the audience has enjoyed this. Uh, I hope you agree that Jody has this incredible way of getting to know people and then taking remarkable images of them. But then the fact that she can then tell you about the image and remember who these people are and where they're from and what they're up to. And uh, I think it's, it just makes it even richer. Um, let me stop the sharing and let's open it up to comments or questions. Uh, by the way, you, you were all muted, so I'm going to ask that if you want to speak, um, I'll just raise your hand, I'll, I'll unmute you. Or I think you might be able to unmute yourselves. Um, okay, I'm allowing the participants to unmute themselves now. <laughs> <laughs> So what do people think? Is it, isn't it a great, like a visual time capsule of humanity in the middle of New York at a time of crisis? Don't be shy, any, any questions or thoughts? I, no, that, that's just what I wrote, that they are really beautiful images. 
And I was going to write up a terrible time. For me, it has been difficult. <laughs> so, uh -huh. and, but the images were so beautiful, Jody. Congratulations, really. And the way that you explained what you were trying to, to show through them or tell us through them was also wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Rosa, by the way, is in Mexico City. So you see this talk is officially international. It's not just US. Okay. I'm seeing some of the wonderful comments uh, here in, in the chat. Um, anyone else? Oh, here, let me, let me unmute. <laughs> Okay. Hi. Hi. Sorry. For some reason, I couldn't unmute. Um, they're just so splendid. I I was so moved because the the combination of the background with the person, the person still was central, but around it was such a story that, it, of course, is enhanced by Jody. As you know, all of these people we've talked for years about your photography, and I think it just gets better and better. Um, there's a kind of interest that you have in, in, in the person, but then all the little things in the background have a kind of meaning that um, adds to it. And, um, and of course, very moving. Because you care about the people, mm. with all of your talent uh, as a photographer, you also have a deep feeling for these people. and. It really shows. So thank you. It was, as I said in my, in my chat, I said, it's sort of, I'm receiving this the way I've received nature with Ansel Adams. You know, there's a way that I just let it flow over me and it's quite beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. You know, and I, I feel like it's really not about me as a photographer. It's about my subject matter letting me in. I mean, that's the real gift when I go out and photograph. Okay, let me unmute some other folks that are trying to do so. Uh, <laughs> Beverly. Hi, Jody. Oh my God, that's so fabulous. So powerful and so impressive. I, I know you would tell me days you were going out to the park and doing your photography. And uh, I mean, it's just amazing how you're able to find these people and then actually take the time to connect with them. And it really it, it makes me feel connected to them as well through your lens. And I'm really proud of you. Thank you. Um, oh, let me, uh, I see some hands raised, Karen. Yeah, well, I mean, what was what was really striking for me is that during COVID, basically what you're trying to do is stay away from people. Uh, we're kind of afraid of other people. You're, you know, you're supposed to be distanced. You're supposed to be avoiding people. And so for you to go the other way around and instead of avoiding people actually make the connection, that's what I found uh, so fascinating about your experience with COVID versus, versus mine, which has been avoidance and isolation. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I, I just felt like um, I needed to be out there because, you know, I live alone and, you know, I needed that connection with people, you know, at a distance. But I, I really like yearn for that. And I know by going there that other people yearned to have somebody listen to them. We were all in the same situation. Mm hmm. Susie, Mosa. How are you? Hi. Um, I, sorry, I jumped on late, but I so enjoyed, um, Jody the second half of the presentation. And being a um, displaced New Yorker, I just loved seeing, you brought me home. You absolutely brought me home. To see um, the, the people during this time when, you know, New York City is usually so bustling, but in fact, in New York City, you're never alone. And I think that you really captured, um, let me back up, some you know, people outside of New York think, oh, New Yorkers are cold and they're not friendly, but 
you really capture emotion. And regardless of whether or not they were looking at you or talking to you or engaged with you, you absolutely capture their humanity. And now that I don't live in New York, sadly, um, I really miss the, the fact that people in New York do wear their humanity openly, as opposed to other places where I feel like it's kind of superficial, at least where I live. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, and then the Columbus Circle is my old neighborhood, so it's also my entrance to the park. So I just I love that you brought me home. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Oh, uh, let's see here. Sorry, guys. Um, this whole amazing thing is. Um, I will absolutely get to all of you. Let's see. I see Rick. Hi, I just wanted to say beautiful work. Thank you. And um, hello to a fellow Portland native. Oh, really? <laughs> now, now living in New York also. <laughs> Thanks for being here tonight. Yeah, thank you. And Karen, I saw your hand up. <laughs> Hi there, Jody. I just want to share that Jody has an incredible connection with people. I know this from someone who worked with her for a number of years and got to travel a little bit of the world with her. And I was so pleased to see some of her work displayed here. And it was beautifully done, Efren. You put it together so nicely. And thank you, Jody, for sharing this this evening. You're welcome. Thanks, Karen. Um, anyone else? I, oh, I think I see Diana. Is it Diana? Diana. Hi. Hi, Jody. Diana. How are you? I just wanted to say it was such an honor seeing this beautiful work and what you really um, showed in the cameras that how the, um, the objects, they really trusted you. It really just showed. And that, the, that photograph of that young woman in Russia and Siberia is just Absolutely glorious. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful picture. I'm happy I came. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that the trust factor is um, really important. You know, I don't ever want to exploit somebody or, you know, it was very um, for me to shoot them with dignity. Um, mm. I mean, there were a couple that were like Terry on her with her headstand, but you know, this that was her idea so um you know it was important for me to respect people great i think i saw alexandra's hand I, i'm the person who well i got married during covid times so, uh, <laughs> it, <laughs> it went well so i'm very happy but yeah so i noticed well, you say that for you, it's very important for you to uh, have this relationship with the people that you take photos with. Um, is it, has it always been the case that you want that? You were talking about the Lopez family in Oaxaca and you take photos throughout the yeah. years. Mm -hmm. So you're someone who really prefers, you're very, you seem very minimalistic in the sense that you say you really wanna limit the amount of photos you take in a particular day. And the mm -hmm. same with the number of people that you take photos of. Can you talk more about that for you as you really go into grain with that particular person and see, or is it like in Central Park, was it your way of taking photos of always going for the same people or just circumstantial that it was always the same people at Central Park? Well, I mean, with Central Park, I really sought out um, the same people because I really felt like I had made a new friend. Um, and, you know, it was important to reconnect with them. I didn't want to, I've never been one to like, take a photo of somebody and then leave. Because I feel like it's, um, I don't know, it's just, it, I feel like I'm taking something without really giving anything back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with, with Oaxaca, you know, I'm, this is a 15 year project with, people so I know them on a very intimate, you know, basis. Um, you know, I, um, I'm just, that's the kind of photographer I am. I could never, um, 
shoot like a crowd with people and I know some people are great at that like Shay you know is great at that Shay Kong but you know I just I just feel like I'm that's not my personality because they say you know the camera is um you know a part of who you are so that's kind of how I photograph and I'll always photograph that but it took me years to be able to you know find my photographic voice and I did that through Mary Ellen so um you know it was just a matter of going back and back and back no hundred rolls of film you know I could do two and get what I want so uh Susan hi Jody hi Susan how are you good um well, one quick question with the photograph of Paola. Mm -hmm. Is Paola the one when we were there, we went into the courtyard of her home and the way how all these puppets were inside? I was just wondering if it was the same Paola. No, no different one. Okay. Um, yeah. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your work with Mary Ellen over 15 years, how you, how, what things did change for you, you know, in terms of um, how you saw things, how you framed things, and then, you know, um, you know, your decisions to shoot in black and white. And uh, I mean, cause I know that you worked very, you know, you were, you have spent lots and many, many years there and really pushing yourself and, it's not about, I don't think it's much about you finding people. People are always there to be found. It's, you've always had, you've always been able to see people, you know, um, right. and that's, you know, and, um, but what is it that you, how, when you see people, what do you see? And then how do you sort of begin to, bring out certain things that you might see in them that they might not see in themselves? Um. Oh, that's an interesting question. You know, I think, you know, an initial um, meeting with somebody, I can kind of get a little, you know, like, do I want to continue this friendship and photograph them or not? Um, are they the kind of person that would let me in? Because some people I've photographed, you know, there's just a wall up you know and um so i think you know i try to focus on the friendship and getting their guard down and you know focusing on just um being their friend basically before i start photographing them and that's um kind of where things lead me you know into long-term projects so does that answer your question or and then you have this amazing body of work yeah so, but yeah. um i mean it's very lyrical and it's very human humanistic um in both you know and in, in beautiful ways and in sad ways and i think you know we should we don't we shouldn't close our eyes to sadness you know right. there but um do you see yourself putting a book together or you know, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm letting the project evolve. Um, you know, I'm not, it's interesting. Um, do I plan on, but yeah, I mean, ideally, I think that's what most photographers would like to do. And after all these years, um, yeah, I, I, I would consider that. Um, I forgot the other train of thought you were saying. <laughs> I don't know. You know, we always <laughs> forgot our train of thought. But that's <laughs> I remember one incident in Oaxaca, though. This is when Susan and I were taking, she, <laughs> taking a couple workshops. And I had a hotel room with a bathtub. Oh, yeah. It was great. Yeah. And, and they were all in the restaurant. And I thought, well, this is going to be a great photo op for me to have some of these kids. They all have their clothes on, but, you know, they never get in a bathtub. So I thought, let's have a party. You know, let's get all the kids in the bathtub with their clothes on and let them have fun. So, <laughs> what happened then? I, then I said, then somebody came over and said, want to join us for dinner. And I said, well, I'm here with all these kids. And then I kept obsessing, like, 
God, they're going to think like I'm a Michael Jackson here. <laughs> you remember that? Well, I remember we were, we were in one night we were in, you had photographed one girl and we were in the restaurant eating and she came in. This is probably, you know, a, cu a couple of days after you had been photographing her. Because one of the things she really wanted was just to take a luxurious bath, you know. Because right. you had you had the hotel room that had a nice bath. The bath I was in the adjacent room. You had a bathtub, a nice right for yeah. And um, I remember she came in and she brought a couple of friends with her because they wanted now to come back mm -hmm. to go and be in the bathtub with the bubble baths wow. and um and there were more girls that were coming and i just remember you were in your room and uh the um you got a phone call from downstairs at the front desk you know and it was like oh my god we're getting busted but <laughs> it was actually a couple of more girls who wanted to come up and just enjoy the bubble you know and uh we were like oh um so, yeah. that's so. So in the interest of time, because I know we are over the hour, but I, you know, there's a lot of comments on the group chat, which I just want you to know, I'm going to save those and I'll, 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 you will be able to review them. But I think one of them that really says, says it all is, um, you know, humanize, you, you humanized the grotesque time that we went through. And, and again, just like the story of the girls wanting to take the bubble bath, um, it really is uh, about you, Jody, making this remarkable connection with human beings, whether they're little girls in Oaxaca or someone struggling at the Bethesda Fountain in 2020 in New York. Um, it, it's really an amazing thread. It's very humanistic, someone said. Um, it's very, very touching, very moving work. So I want to thank you on behalf of everyone for sharing this work with you. And and by the way, um, I love the question about you know are you going to have a book or what's you know what's up with that? Because um, I do think this is the kind of work more people need to see. Um, I'm delighted that we had whether it was 40 or 50 people here, but I think they would agree that this is this is great stuff. Um, this is stuff that many, many more people should enjoy. So thank you, Jody, very much. And thank you, everyone that was able to make it tonight. Yeah, thank you. And stay tuned because um, uh, I, you know, we can send out, you know, Jody's website, certainly. And, um, and then also stay tuned for the next conversation with another photographer. So have a great evening. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And thanks, Efren. Thank you, Jody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.